through those things is that we have life and breath for another day, that we have been forgiven of our sins, past, present, and future through the blood of Jesus, that we have been adopted as sons and daughters of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we have been given his Holy Spirit that leads us and guides us, and we have hope not only for this life, but also for the life to come in eternity. We have much to bless the Lord for this morning, and we have much to praise and glorify the name of the Lord for what he's doing in Cornerstone Church and also what he is doing in Providence Church, or what we have faith and hope that he will do in Providence Church. Because what God is doing here is something that we hoped and dreamed and prayed for uh, many years ago. And so this is going to be a, a bit different of a service for us today. It's a special service as we get to commission uh, Brian Allen, his wife Kendall, and the core team of Providence Baptist Church to plant this new congregation in Beaumont. And like I said, man, we've been praying for this. We, we prayed for this before Cornerstone Church was planted, and God is bringing to fruition a vision that he'd give, given us, and he's doing more, really, than all that we could have ever hoped or dreamed in what he's done. And, and so we praise him for that, and we are excited to send out these incredibly gifted men and women of God. Why would we do that? Why would we celebrate them not joining with us at Cornerstone, but instead being sent out from amongst us to plant a new church, a different church in Beaumont? Well, it's because we truly believe that church planting, that making disciples through the planting of churches is the most effective evangelistic method under heaven. That nothing else, not parachurch ministries or revival services or mega churches or outreach programs can have the kingdom advancing impact that church planting does when people far from God are reached with the gospel of God and then they are trained up and discipled and brought to spiritual maturity in a healthy gospel centered Bible teaching spirit filled church and so that's what we're about that's what we're excited about this morning. That's what we get to celebrate with the sending out of Providence Baptist Church. In Acts chapter 13, greatest, one of the greatest church planting churches of all time, the church at Antioch, says this. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. It's with that same heart, it's with that same desire that we are going to pray over and commission Brian and Kendall and the, the church plant team to do this work. And so would you, would you pray with me for our service and that we would bless the Lord in our worship today. Father, we praise you God, for the work that you are doing amongst us. God, we praise you for the work that you're doing in and through Cornerstone Church, that you're answering prayers from many years ago in ways that we could have never anticipated or expected. God, that when we planted, we said we want to be a sending church. We want to be a church planting church, a multiplying church, a church that is open-handed with incredibly gifted people like these. And God, I pray for Providence Church that they would also be planted pregnant, born pregnant in, in the desire to plant other churches and that we would see gospel saturation in mid-county and to the ends of the earth where every man, woman, boy, and girl would have the opportunity to have a daily encounter with someone who knows Jesus Christ. God, be pleased with our service this morning. We want to bless your name. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Can you stand with us and worship? Good morning, church. Well, let's worship our Father today. We will fear the battle. We won't fear the night. We will walk the valley with you by our side. You will go before us. You will lead the way. We have found a refuge. Only you can say. Sing with joy now. Our God is for us, the Father's love. 
rock is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. No love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Come on, sing even when I stumble. Even when I stumble, even when I fall, even when I turn back, still your love is sure. You will not abandon, you will not forsake. You will cheer me on with never-ending grace. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Neither height nor depth can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us holds me in his love. Neither height nor depth can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave His Son to free us Holds me in His love I'll sing with joy Sing with joy now Our God is for us The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress Raise your voice now No love is great against us if our God is for us.
Jesus is my seated. Good morning, church. My name is Eric Morgan, for those that don't know me. And I'm an elder of Providence Baptist Church, and it is my pleasure to be here this morning to uh, share a little testimony with you guys. Ryan asked me to prepare about a five to seven minute testimony about how this kind of church has came to be. As I mentioned to Ryan earlier today, it is not quite five or seven minutes, but it's not quite 30. So uh, somewhere in between, and then you get Brian for about an hour. So uh, have a good seat, get some coffee and water, hopefully. Um, before I get started in the testimony, I just want to pray. I want to pray for the Lord just to um, be glorified in this testimony, be glorified through Brian's word. I'm thankful for Casey, this bald head guy that um, was singing new today. He is the worship pastor for Providence Baptist Church. Our worship leader. So we are so grateful to have him and Caitlin lead us this morning and we'll be leading out in Providence. So I'll pray and then I'll get into the testimony. Father, we are so thankful for you. We are so thankful for your grace and your mercy. Uh, we thank you for um, how you provide everything that we need. God, I pray that as, um, as we proclaim this testimony this morning, as Brian preaches your word, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will just be on the hearts of people and let them see how you provide. And there is nothing wasted in this life, that everything works for a purpose that you have called into place. God, we love you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's kind of two texts that come to mind as I think about the testimony of Providence Baptist Church. And the first text is Psalm 139.1. Through six, and I'll read. It says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, and I cannot attain it. This is a great imagery of how the Lord has purposefully placed everything in our life and relationships in our life for his purpose and for his kingdom. And I think about this, and 
the, the timeline I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a, a short glimpse of will be expounded on, I think, through Brian's sermon a little bit. But you will see in my prayers that you will see from the beginning of time, obviously, but we can trace back 16 years ago when the Lord first started orchestrating the plant of his church in Beaumont, Texas for Providence Baptist. And, and, and there is no doubt in my mind that, that he knew that that was going to happen then and this day was coming. So I'll start with 16 years ago. I was, me and Brian grew up together. He is much older than I am. But we did grow up together. Um, and as he was starting his career at ExxonMobil, a new graduate from Texas A&M, his mom approached me at our, at our local church. Uh, we went to the same church, Peach Tree Baptist in Jasper. And she says, hey, Eric, do you know my son Brian? I said, no, ma'am, he's so much older. I've never heard of him before. And uh, no, I'm just joking. And I said, yes, ma'am. And so she said, well, hey, he just started ExxonMobil in Beaumont. You're moving to Beaumont for Lamar. You know, maybe you guys could meet up. And so we exchanged numbers, and I thought, there's no way this cat's going to call me. I mean, I'm too young. I mean, he's much older, and so it's just, it's just not going to happen. So sure enough, I tell him when I'm moving in, and then Brian calls me on a Monday. Right after I move in over the weekend, and he says, hey, man, there's this Bible study uh, at this guy's John's house. I think you should come. And me being a new Christian, I, I lied, my, lied my pants off. I said, man, I, I'm so busy with school right now. And, you know, he says, class started? I said, no, not, not yet. But um, i got to figure it out. So I lied to him, and uh, he, I didn't go to Bible study. And so, but thinking that that would be the end of it, Brian, the persistent guy that he is, uh, called back the next Monday and says, hey, man, we're going to this Bible study. Do you want to come? And I said, I can't lie twice. So, so I'll go, and I'll appease him, and then he won't ask me anymore. So I went. And there was about five or six other guys there, and um, that that Monday night changed my whole life. I, you know, I mentioned I just came to know Christ, and it was about a year ago, a year before that. And these guys, I walk in, and and they're all about mid twenties or so. And uh, one one guy in particular, they they all formed my spiritual life over over time. But one guy took me in. His name was Elijah. He was pretty much like a spiritual dad to me, and, and Brian will talk about that as well. I think he was part of that for Brian, and, uh, but Elijah took me in, um, and he discipled me for several years of college. I, I was not on the four-year track. I was on the six, so he, he discipled me for the full six years of college, and, and this discipleship was a little different. It was not like, let's meet for coffee. It was, hey, I'm painting my house. Would you like to come work? And I'm like, that sounds like child labor. Um, so, but I went, and he got free labor out of me, but he shared Jesus the whole time. And through Elijah, I met a guy named Lee Parker. And Lee Parker taught me how to evangelize to college students. And so Lee and I did a college ministry for about three and a half years while I was at Lamar. And he, he taught me how to do ministry with kids. Lee had two children and a wife, and he would bring them along. And we would all hang out with these college students, and we would share the gospel and feed them and uh, he, he taught me how to integrate family into ministry. And then I graduated college, and um, Brian and Kendall and their family was at one church. Elijah was, was at a different church. My wife, Caitlin, and I were at another church, and Lee and his family was at it. So all four different spots. And so we did do a lot of ministry for about five years together. And then early 2016, Lee calls me up. He says, hey, there's a new church plant uh, at Lamar, planted by Westgate Baptist, and um, North End Baptist Church, I think you guys should consider being a part of it. So we were at a spot in our current church, and uh, we talked to the leaders there. We decided it was, it was a good time for us to step down and kind of go help this church plant. So we went and did ministry there for about two years, and that's where we got to meet Greg and Chelsea Lee and their family, and then John Batterson and Leela Batterson. And we developed relationships with them, and who's also part of the core team. And for the next two years, we did ministry together, and then about late 2017, early 2018, the Lord called us to step away, and our three families stepped away from that church and started praying, well, what's next? What do we do? And so we started meeting as a home church, and um, I'll tell you that that's pretty hard to reach people in Beaumont, because if you tell them you're meeting at a home, they think you're a cult, right? So... We were meeting as a home, and so our home church pretty much stayed three to five people, five families uh, for a while, and Greg and I, Greg co-led with me, and we actually met with Ryan and Paul in April of 2018, 
And we said, well, hey, what does it look like to plant a church off of Cornerstone? And could we do that? And so we, we all joined together praying. Uh, we led our group through a, a time of prayer and fasting, and we just felt like it was not the right time. Ryan and Paul were open and willing to, to come alongside of us at that point and, and do it, but we just felt like, no, it's just not right. And primarily because the Lord was holding his hand for Brian. The Lord knew that Craig and I did not need to be the, the primary preachers. That is just not our gifting. And uh, so he was, he was waiting. We were waiting on Brian. And uh, it was so cool because also that year, you know, Brian and I, we'd been separated from ministry for about six or seven years at that time, and maybe eight. And um, we went to a pastor's conference together. So me and Brian, Ryan and my brother went to Minneapolis. And Brian and I got to ride on the plane from Beaumont to Minneapolis and the Minneapolis back home. And it was during that time where I got to hear Brian's heart and passion for preaching. He said, you know, Ryan's been giving me opportunities to preach at Cornerstone, and he was talking to his pastor at the time about doing some more preaching for them, and just this burden for preaching, and of course, it didn't, no light bulb went off at that point for me, that like, hey, this could be our guy, you know, um, but we, we kept praying, and it was August or September of 2018, and um, the next, the ne which brings me to the next text, which is Acts 16, it was where Paul uh, was forbidden to go into Asia. Now, I'm not, I'm geographically challenged, but Asia somewhere down here and Macedonia somewhere up here and separated between a body of water. And it says he was forbidden by the Spirit to go there so that later he would go to Macedonia. And at the, I was doing my Bible study and praying, and I felt like we were forbidden in April to go be a church plant off Cornerstone. And it wasn't because that would never happen. It was just we were forbidden because we were waiting on Brian. And the Lord had been working in Brian's heart, unknowingly to me, to plant a church and working in Kendall's heart for them to, to start that process. And so I called Greg and I said, hey, Greg, um, here's some stuff going on. You know, here's what I'm thinking. This, this guy, Brian, and of course, Greg knew who Brian was. So then I met with Brian and Ryan, and Brian proceeded to tell me that he had been feeling this burden to plant a church. Like, man, this, God just fully aligned us at that point of, we were waiting for this guy to be a preacher, pastor, and Brian was it. And it was very clear to me that morning and that, that the weeks to come that, that Brian was going to be the pastor of our home church slash church plant. And so over the next few months, we started integrating our groups together, and um, September 29th, we just looked at it, September 29th of last year, was whenever we had our first core team meeting for Providence Baptist Church. And everyone I just mentioned, you know, was all, they were all part, Greg, the, the Lees, the Battersons, the Allens, and, and us, we were all part of that initial team. But then you interject Casey, and Casey will plug into this timeline, I'm sure that Brian has, has put together, but you'll see how the Lord has placed him here today for this church as well. And so, what I hope to, you see through this story, guys, is that every relationship, whether you see it today or five years down the road or 16 years down the road, there is a purpose in that relationship. And actually, you might not ever see it. You might, be, you, you might meet someone and you be an encouragement to them and you'll never know it. But God has designed a purpose for every relationship. And at the right time, he will reveal that relationship to you or to the other person that needs it. And so your time is not wasted. Every single moment of your life is counted for, for the glory of God, and for the sake of the gospel. So I'll pray for us, and then I'll turn it over to Brent. Father, we thank you, God, for your love and your grace, and thank you for this time. Thank you for Brent, for Ryan, for Paul, for Stephen, and for this church, God, and the encouragement they have been to Providence Baptist, God, and the uh, the the prayers they've offered, the, the leadership help they've offered, God, the, um, the love they've, they've given. God, we thank you for them. God, I pray for this church, God, as, as they are continue to pursue you, I pray that you would continue equipping these men to lead this church in full pursuit of making much of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Healthy disciples make more disciples, and healthy churches make more churches, and so we love that that's hardwired 
here into Cornerstone, and it's already hardwired into Providence as well. And so, and we, we just always want everyone connected with our ministries to think about how God might use you. Just, it may not be this year, it may not be next year, but in, at some point in your life that God would use you to multiply the kingdom by moving out and with gospel purposes to start new works. And so um, I, I'm very grateful just for the chance um, to pray for the, these this church plant and also for just for their leaders. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and do that now. I know we're praying a lot. It's church. It's okay. <laughs> God, I thank you so much for the great privilege that we have to make more disciples and to plant more churches. And so we just pray you'll bless Brian and Eric and their families, we just thank you for the way in which they've blessed our family, our church family, and we just ask that you just watch over them and protect them from the work of the enemy, because we know just as thrilled as we are is to see you moving in this direction, that he will come against, he has come against it, and yet you continue to thwart him, um, and so we thank you that you're more powerful, and we thank you that you, can, you, you continue to accomplish every purpose that you have. We thank you just for these testimonies uh, this morning of just how you've been working out these plans uh, for decades in, in lives of people that are connected to our church. And so we just thank you for the privilege it is to see those things just manifested now at this point in time because you've orchestrated them. So we just thank you for all of our different church planters, all of our missions that, w that we support um, in Texas and in the U.S. and all around the world. And we just pray that you will continue to draw more lost people to yourself and that you'll bring them into relationship with people at Providence, and also that you'll bring, draw more lost people to yourself and bring them into relationship with Cornerstone, and that we'll see people saved through our combination of ministries that will eventually start churches, that will start churches so that we will just see your faithfulness of the gospel being proclaimed for decades and for a century to come. And we pray all these things in your powerful name. Amen. That's probably going to fall off on me when I shake the stand here. I'm going to set this on. Well, good morning. Um, it's so, so cool to see actual people in seats. Uh, you watch like the Astros and you see them hitting balls into the Crawford boxes and these cardboard people sitting there like, you know, it's like <laughs> actual real life people. So, uh, but anyway, uh, so this morning like, uh, is a little bit different. I usually am exegeting a passage of Scripture, but this morning it's more te a testimony, again, of, of uh, how God got me here and how God got us here to this point. So um, I'm going to spend a majority of the time talking about just the sovereign hand of God to get us here, and then just a few minutes at the end talking about the future hopes and dreams of Providence. Um, so let me pray, pray, and then we'll start. Father, I just praise you uh, that we're standing here doing this right now, Lord. I just praise you um, just for the, the mountain-moving, um, sovereign, planner, wise God that gets people to this point and gets groups of people to this point. And um, we just praise you, Father. We thank you that you are wise and good. And I just pray that you would help uh, Spirit glorify the Father, glorify the Son as people hear what you've done. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, so the name of our church is Providence Baptist Church. So, um, you know, I, I know it's probably hard for you guys to imagine, but it's kind of hard for a group of more than like one person to agree on the name of a church. <laughs> um, so we started with Live Oak Church. I was really super excited about that. But then we found out that there was actually a Live Oak Church in Beaumont already, so that, that went in the trash can. And then we thought about Living Hope, but we couldn't agree on that. And then maybe Sovereign Grace. And then we thought, well, somebody proposed City Light, but that kind of sounded like a beer and not a church. And then, and then there was like Grace City. Um, and then I even proposed Lux Church, right? Because it was kind of like light. And I proposed it to Ryan, and Ryan just straight up laughed at me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he just laughed at me. So, but one night, so one night we're driving home from a core team meeting, and... and uh, Kindle's in the car, and she says, what about Providence? And instantly I loved it. Like, instantly I loved the name, and then, we, and then you know, whenever you love a name, you kind of, like, cross your fingers and your legs, and you go to the other people in the church group, and you're like, what about Providence? And they loved it, and it was, like, unbelievable. We all agreed on this name. So, so what does Providence mean? 
What does the word providence mean? And so the word isn't in the Bible. So you can't go to chapter and verse and just like, here's your definition of providence. But kind of like the word trinity, it's also not in the Bible, but the, the principles and the examples of it are all over Scripture. So, um, so here's my best shot at a biblically informed definition of the word providence, okay? God's providence is the exercise of His sovereignty to guide and control all circumstances, events, nature, and humanity to accomplish all of His wise and good purposes. And so this includes God's sovereignty to control all things, to provide His children with what they need to accomplish His wise and good purposes. And so that's kind of what I'm going to be sharing coming up is just some of the examples of this. Um, Isaiah 46, 9 through 11 is, is probably the closest biblical definition of providence there is, even though it doesn't say the word. It says, um, this is God speaking. He says, Remember the former things long past, for I am God, <clears throat> and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. And listen to this. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying... My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a, car, a far country, truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it, surely I will do it. And that's probably the closest clear definition of just the providence and sovereignty of God uh, that, that that word entails. So, so God has like providentially uh, orchestrated a ton of things to bring this church together. Eric talked about several. And to draw me as a pastor to preach, and it was, you know, like he said, beginning decades ago. So, so, so starting, uh, you know, early on, right? Really early on. So apparently, because Eric said I'm really old, so really early on. <laughs> So God, uh, God sovereignly chose to, to, to plop me into a home where almost everybody loved God. I had zero choice in that, right? I didn't choose that like God did, and it's pure mercy, right? My parents, grandparents were the first ones to tell me about the gospel, to share the gospel with me, to model the gospel. Uh, my grandparents, my parents, um, and help me understand scripture. And so, so I grew up in Jasper. Uh, that's where I, all this was happening, and like Eric said, that's where we, I used to ride four-wheelers to that dude's house when I was like, I don't know, 12 years old. And I wasn't going to include this story, but since he called me old, now I'm going to include it. <clears throat> this is my first memory of Eric Morgan. I went to his house, and I met him, and he's, he's raising pigs for 4-H, right? <clears throat> so he's got this little fence area there with his, and he's like 10 years old, little kid, and he's, he's, he's making this a show pig, right? And so he's going to get this pig, he's going to train this pig to like walk in a straight line or something like this, I can't remember. But he had this little, little swatter stick with a little rubber thing on it. And so he's trying to get this pig to walk the way, and this pig won't do it. And he's like smacking this pig with this little rubber stick. Well, come to find out, the pig was blind in one eye. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was my first memory of Eric, was him smacking a pig. So, yes, that's what you get for calling me old, but... So, so I went to college, and uh, uh, God saved me, I believe, when I was six years old through discipleship of my grandparents, my parents. But anyway, I, I, graduated, I went to college, um, kind of driving to college. My heart was like, I don't know how I'm going to be. I don't know whether I'm going to, I don't know, honestly. Like, I kind of want to do some crazy stuff, a little bit. Um, and I, I get to college, and uh, I got roommates that love Jesus. No choice of my own. Like one of the one of the one of the roommates was a 16 year old kid that was a drunk, and he actually got kicked out. And then this guy, he was a junior, and they don't ever put juniors with freshmen in here. So this this poor junior gets moved into a freshman uh, dorm uh, room, like we shared four rooms in a common area. And his name was Chase Isaminger. Um, so again, his, so his willingness to even befriend me as a, I'm a punk freshman kid, he's a junior, just that willingness was just a grace of God in and of itself. But, but Chase grabbed hold of me and discipled me, and he prayed with me, and we prayed together. We saw God answer tons of prayers. 
And he befriended me, and Chase was God's means of guarding the trajectory of my faith and keeping me in Christ in that season. And as a result of him discipling me, he he graduated before me, obviously, but I was spurred to disciple other men through college, and that was my first experience teaching the Bible. If Chase doesn't grab me and disciple me, do I do that? I don't know. Here, this is exactly what Eric said. Like, if, any, if you take away anything from this testimony, it's just be faithful to disciple the people in your life, right? Um, so then in 2001, God brings me this amazing, beautiful lady named Kendall Robbins, and, and I made her Kendall Allen. But, um, so as I got to know her early on, in 2001, I met her. Like, God was in the process of transforming this woman's heart and growing her and saving her in front of my eyes. And so uh, we started dating March of 2002, and ever since then, she's been the greatest gift to me besides my salvation in my life. Um, God providentially provided me with a helper suitable for me, a best friend and a ministry partner and a bride and her. Uh, Without her, I can't pastor, you know? Like, um, she loves Providence. She loves the people in it. Uh, 2003... This is getting into that Elijah time frame. So 2003, I, I took a co-op with ExxonMobil in Beaumont, Texas. And so I met this super strange guy named Elijah Culpepper. Uh, and he's laughing because he knows him, right? So this cat, man, he talked differently. He thought differently. And he did things like way differently than anybody I had ever met. But the reason was because he was living his life in obedience to Jesus to a degree that I don't think I'd ever seen anybody live before. And so because of this, about 20% of the time I was mad at him because he was gently challenging me on my poor assumptions about what it meant to follow Jesus and my theology. And he was spurring me to further and to, to obey Jesus further and further. And then 80% of the time I'm, I'm thanking him for, for helping me see the scriptures, right? Um, So during that time, Elijah invited me into this group of people called Lit that he mentioned. And I was in that group for two to three years where Elijah was doing those same things, like dragging me into service stuff, dragging me into mercy mercy ministries, helping me study the word, like teaching me how to study the word. How huge is that, right? Teaching people how to study the word so they can read the word and see truth in it themselves. Um. So God providentially brings me into this guy's life, Elijah, to take me from being this immature uh, dude having enough biblical knowledge to be dangerous, honestly, to having this much greater understanding of God and how to study the Scriptures and what it meant to truly follow Jesus. So just the mercy of God. And so, by the way, this guy named Casey Rucker was part of that lit group, and he was playing the guitar and leading worship 15 years ago. So uh, several months ago, Kendall and I were just like, you know, man, it would be awesome if Casey Rucker and Stephanie could, could come be a part of this thing and like could, be, could, could play and sing for our church. And guess what? Eric and Caitlin were kind of having those same thoughts about the same time. And, uh, and we really hadn't hung out with them in like 12 years or something like that. Um, and we prayed for God to call them to our church. And it just so happened that Greg Lee, just so happened, right, Providence, that Greg Lee runs into him at like a birthday party or something, I can't remember what it was, and he shares the details of the church with Casey, and, uh, and now the Ruckers are coming alongside us to help us plant the church and worship, and with the blessing of his pastor at Praise, that they love that church, but he's coming with the blessing of their church. So, so just 15 years before, we were discipled by the same guy, Elijah, worshipped in the same group. We go 12 years without seeing each other, and then now he's leading, the Lord's called him to lead the, lead the church in worship, right? How's that for God's providence? Providence, you know what I mean? Come on. And then, and then there's Eric and the mandates, like he talked about, right? So my mom sets us up on the mandates. Uh, we meet... We meet uh, we meet every Thursday. We, we did this. We, we met at a wing joint every Thursday. It's since closed. But we would meet and just talk about God and talk about life and work, school, whatever, and just became really good friends. 
The best thing I did for him was introduce him to Elijah <laughs> and, and introduce him to this lit group. Um, and so he was discipled by Elijah too. And so um, lit, that group multiplied, like he talked about, into geographical locations on purpose. It wasn't a split, like we weren't angry with each other. We did it on purpose. And um, I started leading one of the groups and Eric went with another group. And, and we, we didn't really worship together for a decade or more. Um, life happened. We're different ministries. And so I, Kendall and I were, were leading this other lit group, and we love those people. They became like family to us. And Eric and, and them were leading elsewhere and part of Campus Church. You heard that? So <clears throat> fast forward 10 years. So 10 years to 2015, I'm working at the polyethylene plant. And then Ryan, dude named Ryan Thompson moved over to the polyethylene plant where I was working. And he was like this like superstar management material guy that they were like grooming to be a big, big wig, you know. And so in spite of that, I still talk to him. And, uh, and so, um, but, but we just discovered as we got to talking that we both loved the Lord and we both loved the word and we both loved to teach. And it was at that point that Ryan and I became friends, and he's one of my best friends to this day. But then he did something crazy. He quit ExxonMobil, right? And he took a pay cut, and he moved to Huntsman. And uh, it didn't take him long to talk about work-life balance and 980 schedule for him to convince me to go apply for a job over there. And so I went to work with Ryan in 2015. <clears throat> and so our offices are literally, they've been, since the beginning, our offices have been through one wall. Like, we've had offices right next to each other. And so we would talk theology and ministry for like minutes a day in case my boss is watching, like, <laughs> like minutes. <laughs> I mean, it was just so good. Um, so, but then, but then Ryan started talking crazy talk, right? He started talking about, he said he felt called to plant a church in Nederland, Texas. And I can remember kind of calling him into my office, and I kind of had like, it's like look of concern on my face. I was like, why? You know, why, why would you plant a church in a city where there's churches on every corner? Like, dude, come on, bro. Like, why wouldn't you just lead out within an existing church? You know, just, just lead out in an existing church. And it's at that point that Ryan grabbed my dry erase markers, and I had my dry erase board, and he started drawing circles and lines and saying words like oikos and stuff like that. <laughs> And so he presented this really compelling case for local church planting that I had never heard before. And it was that, that was when that seed got planted for the possibility of church planting. Because for the first time in my life, I had this whole new category of a bivocational church planter that I could literally observe his life every day, talk to him every day. I didn't know that it was possible to pastor more than about 10 people unless you quit your day job, went to four years of seminary, and then put your resume out to a church that had a vacancy. Like, I thought that's just how it worked. I thought that's the only way that it worked. And so I had this whole new category opened up. And so from then until 2016, Ryan just continued to expose me to church planting through these daily conversations about church and Cornerstone and life in the church. And Cornerstone, you guys have been the biggest in the, in the development of this church, like have been the biggest encouragement toward an affirmation of my desire to pastor local church. I mean, just seeing Cornerstone, honestly. Um, so 2015, uh, you know, I start working in Port Natchez and I live in Lumberton. So that's a 80 to 90 minutes in the truck a day, right? It's a long drive. And so I started listening to sermons uh, and so I, I, I listened through Audible to Piper's, John Piper's Roman series. That's 143 hours of sermons. 143 hours of sermons. It took him eight years to preach through. And then I listened to his Hebrew series, and that was another, I don't know how many hours, but it took him three years to preach through that. So I listened to 11 years of sermons from a local church. And so what that did was, one, it gave me a whole lot better understanding of Romans and Hebrews, and I worshiped the Lord out of that. But one of the biggest things it did for me was I basically listened to 11 years of a local church's life, and I got to hear in the background of the sermons the life of a church. 
So I got to hear Piper talk about working with his elders and how the elder body functioned. And I got to hear these ups and downs of church life. I got to hear his love for his fellow elders and his love for the church. Um, I got to hear about, you know, through the sermons, the church's growth spiritually, like the, the degree of obedience that, that these people of the church were growing in, and then the size of the church growing. And, and all of these things just like resonated with me um, and gave me this passion for the lo- like seeing the beauty of a local church that I'd never seen before. I mean, we'd always kind of been like this rogue Bible study that had people from multiple churches. And now I'm starting to see, like, wow, the local church is a beautiful thing. It can be a beautiful thing. And, um, and then one day, one of the sermons, it was, he got to, like, Romans 5. And uh, that happened to be his 20-year anniversary at the church, this Piper's. And so he preaches this sermon called 20 Years in Romans. And I encourage everybody to go listen to that sermon. It's really good. But what he did was he, he gave 20 things that he was thankful for for the 20 years of ministry that he had been a part of. And every one of those things, every one of those 20 things was just like bombs going off in my heart. I'm like, yes, I want that. I want that. I want that. I want to be thankful for that. And I want to be thankful for that. Um, And so I'm just going to give you a couple that probably were some of the most powerful. So this was his number four thing that he was thankful for. So he said, I thank God for hundreds of hearts awakened to the gospel of the glory of Christ. This is what he said. He said, people born again by the living and abiding word and people who thought they knew God and have been raised out of the slumber of spiritual apathy into a passion for the supremacy of God in all things for the joy of all peoples through Jesus Christ. And this is, listen to what he said. He says, you don't hear some of their stories for years. This is what Eric said. You don't hear some of their stories for years, and then they come up to you and say, it was there in that pew when God did the decisive work in my heart five years ago or ten years ago. And I'm just like, yes, God, please give us that at Providence, right? And then there's number 13 thing. He said, I thank God for the council of elders. He said, in 20 years, there's never been a reason in which I felt estranged from the leadership of the church, which is an understatement. Better to say it positively, for 20 years I have feasted increasingly on the strength-giving wisdom and humility and prayer and faith and doctrinal soundness and joyful Bible-saturated leadership of my fellow elders. Who can estimate the value of that in a pastor's life and in a church's life? when the leaders love each other and are ready to lay down their lives for each other and the church. I mean, come on, like, let me spur the elders here, like, be that for one another, and that's what we want, you know, like, I pray that God raises up lots of elders for Providence over the years to co-lead this church, to co-shepherd the church, and be a unified brotherhood of men fighting for their own faith, for each other's faith as elders, and then for the faith of the church. Like, I just, I praise God for that. I pray for that too, so. And then uh, March 2016, you guys know a lot about this, right? So um, March 2016, we were pregnant with our fourth child, and at at the 20-week anatomical ultrasound, we found out that our unborn son had this severe congenital heart defect. So from March 2016 until, um, until June, our lives were kind of consumed with prayer and anxiety over the unknown of what, what's going to happen. And then Josiah, our son, came on June 23rd, and we loved on that cat for 77 days in, the, in, an, in an ICU room, and then we held him as he went to be with the Lord on September 8th, 2016. And those months and the months after that were the hardest for our family um, that we have been, been through to this date, right? That's been the hardest to this date. But oh my gosh, God taught us so much through that. Like we wouldn't, we wouldn't trade the experience for the world. Um, God taught us so much and used my son's life as one of the main means of calling me into pastoral ministry. And you'll hear why. So through his life, God taught us that there is no limit to the amount of suffering he may call any one of us to in this life. You hear me? We thought, like, 
we kind of thought that uh, subconsciously that deep suffering like that was kind of reserved for other people that might need it, you know, that we didn't need it. Um, and it would never touch us, right? But we should have thought about the cross and the fact that Jesus Christ, beloved of the Father beyond all measure, was called by the Father to suffer more than any of us ever will for the glo- to save us and for the glory of God and for his good. If he was called to that, why in the world would any of us think we're immune from some degree of lesser suffering, right? So that's one of the things that we learned. But he also taught us that there is no limit to the amount of supernatural grace that he would provide to sustain our faith and to use us powerfully through it and even to give us joy right in the smack dab middle of it. No limit. No limit to that. So we learned that the promises found in his word, this was huge. We used to do this all the time. We learned that we got to preach to ourselves. We don't listen to ourselves. We got to preach to ourselves, right? You got to preach to yourself. We learned that we found in his word these promises that were so precious. And then the God that backs those promises and the Holy Spirit that applies those promises in your heart can literally get you through anything looking more like Jesus on the other side. It's true. It's true. Through Josiah's life, he gave me a desire to lead people to this God. I want to, I want to lead people to this God. I want people to know him so that when, when their life takes a turn and, and suffering that is inevitable comes, they'll have that rock. So I want them to know the God who is sovereign over their suffering and pain. And then also the God who is powerful enough to sustain their faith and to give them joy even if the worst happens, right? That's, uh, yeah, I just want people to know that God, and that's what the Lord used his life for. And So then uh, we had this period of like kind of recovery that lasted several months where we just kind of like got out of bed and ate food and stuff and went to the bathroom and repeated for a few, few months. And, uh, and then after, after that, Ryan asked me, to preach at Cornerstone, and back when we were at the shoebox over, at, over, over there, the flower shop, and I preached my first official sermon to you guys about God's work through Josiah. And as I was preparing this sermon, and as I was preaching, the Lord was just giving me joy, and I just felt the Spirit moving and the Spirit working in that and giving me words to say. And then after that sermon... The encouragement of the people at Cornerstone, um, affirming that the Spirit was in it, that was probably when the Lord put the pedal to the metal, like the pedal to the floor for me for pastoral ministry and to the church plant was through you guys and your affirmation of that. So old Ryan is good at, really good at a lot of things, but one thing he's great at, and you should praise God for and he's great at developing people and giving people opportunity to, to, to use their gifts. Like, he's really good at that. And so God used those preaching opportunities that he gave and that you guys allowed me to have to basically affirm the Lord's call to preach and pastor. And I will forever be grateful to him and to you guys as a church for, for being that for me and for being God's means of, of doing that. Um, and then, like Eric said, uh, God brought us together in fall of 2018. He brought this core team together, um, and, uh, and we met for the first time September 2019. So one moment that I will share, uh, one more kind of providential moment. So you've heard this word Elijah, this name Elijah, a bunch and all this. So um, Eric and I were talking on the phone, and we like remembered this together Friday as we were talking, but... In 2012, Elijah was being transferred with Exxon to Houston. So he's leaving. He's, he's leaving the city. He's, you know. And he, uh, he set up, or we set up, I can't remember, this goodbye dinner at a restaurant. I can't remember where it was. And after the meal, he pulled Eric and I aside, and he looked at us with tears in his eyes, and he said something like, I really was not excited about living in Beaumont. Uh, this is not my favorite climate. There's no mountains, and it's not the most exciting city. But I prayed that if God was going to send me here, that he would give me two guys to raise up and send out. And he answered that prayer. 
He put his arms around Eric and I, and then he, he prayed for us both. And I wish I could remember every word of that prayer, but I don't remember a bit of it. But I do remember the moment. And then eight years later, God brought those two same knuckleheads, flawed dudes, back together to shepherd and serve in planting a church. And so what I want us to hear, what I want me to hear is this. You never know the ripple effect God sends into the future by simply obeying his command to make disciples. That's exactly what he said. We, we're on the same page. Like, you never know. That one person, that one son or daughter that you pour into, that one neighborhood kid, that hard hearted coworker, you help come to Jesus, maybe the instrument of God saving dozens or hundreds of people 20 years later. You never know. And so I just pray that we would be faithful to just disciple the people that God's put in our path. So that's how God got us here. So that's how, that's how God got us to this point. So briefly, uh, what's, you know, what do we see as the dreams and visions uh, for Providence? Uh, one simple way to answer that is just kind of look around. Uh, look around at Cornerstone. Um, we, uh, there's that saying, he's a chip off the old block, or like the other, like, the nut doesn't fall far from the tree or whatever. Uh, we love Cornerstone and its mission and vision and ministry philosophy. So ours is very similar to that. Um, there's, there's a few passages of Scripture, just a couple passages of Scripture, that probably capture the passion of me and Eric. And so um, one thing that's really cool about this church plant is the Lord has brought together two people with complementary passions instead of identical passions. Like, we're not both like super word guys, and we're not both super mercy, you know, like he, I'll show you through the passages of scripture. But for me, here's my passion, right? It's kind of summed up in two verses, and I'll just be quick. So Psalm 1, 1 through 3, you guys all know it. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. So there's the negative side, but what's the, what's the point that David's making? Here's the point. How blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. I want people to delight in the word of God because they see... i got to read the next verse because I'm getting ahead of myself. Psalm 119, 10 through 18 says, With all my heart I have sought you, when I'm reading this, listen for the emotion tied to the scriptures, tied to the word, okay? Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have told of the ordinances of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies. How much? As much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may keep your word. In this last part, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. That's my passion, is for people to uh, be filled with joy in the Lord, in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because they have seen him clearly and know him deeply from deep and wide knowledge of his word. That's my passion. So I want our people to see for themselves, for ourselves, from the Bible, not from my opinions, the, the glorious truths about who God is, what he's done, what he's doing, and what he promises to do, and then overflow in obedience. And for Eric, his ministry passion is summarized, I think, in Romans 12, 9 through 13. It says, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, the cats devoted to prayer, and then contributing to the needs of the saints and practicing hospitality. So his passions and gifting is mercy ministry, and hospitality, and fostering deep intimacy within community. And so these are complementary gifts, right? 
And I praise God for it. I mean, this, they've led out in that for years. And I just praise God for what he's going to do in leading out with Providence there. And each one of the members of the core team have got unique gifts that they bring. And just look forward to that. So what's next? Um, almost done. One more thing of Providence. So uh, what's next is we, we, we think God may be giving us a building. And, we, and we're going to start services soon. So the building, real quick. So here's one more example of God's providence. Um, Caitlin, in October 2019, saw this building. It was up for sale. It's uh, over behind KFDM off of uh, Louisiana Street. So uh, it went under a contract for full price offer in, I can't remember when it was, but we thought we'd lost the church. So we start, as a core team, looking around Beaumont for places to rent. And man, kind of rat holes for like 3500 bucks a month with a five-year contract. I mean, it's just like hard finding some place in Beaumont. But then that full price offer fell through on this building a couple months later. And so it came back on the market, and we prayed, and we fasted, and we actually made an offer on this building, and it was way below what they were asking. And so it was like, Lord, please help. Um, <clears throat> and, but it was what we could responsibly afford, and so the offer was rejected. Um, and then the building went under contract again with another full price offer. And we were like, all right, this time it's really gone. Um, we thought we lost it again, but we just kept kind of, kind of at peace with it. And then uh, a couple months went by and then that contract fell through. Um, and this, that kind of got us through that March, April full shutdown thing. Right. Um, and then about two and a half months ago, those people reached out to us and asked us to offer them more money. And we just couldn't do it, and we thought it was going to be lost again. And then shortly thereafter, they called and accepted our original offer. And then we received a donation that covered about a quarter of the purchase price. Um, just huge mercy and huge providence and grace towards uh, a group of folks that desperately need help. <laughs> oh, man. So once we get the building, um, Hopefully, Lord willing, mid-September, late September, we plan to start community groups and then open the doors to whoever the Lord would bring. So to wrap this up, we are in awe of God's providence. Um, we are excited about how God brought us to this point, who he's called to us, and we're so grateful to Cornerstone. It's like bittersweet because I'm going to miss hearing that dude preach and hearing the worship, and I'm going to miss you guys. But um, I'll close with this verse. Um, this is like super appropriate. 2 Thessalonians 3.1. It's short and sweet, but this is, this is it, and then we're going to pray. It says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and will be glorified, just as it did also with you. Let's pray. Father, I just praise you for just the miracles that you worked to bring us to this point. And I just pray that your name would be worshipped. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us to be faithful to just disciple the people you've put in our paths and uh, trust you with the 20 years later. And uh, Lord, we just praise you and we worship the name of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's give them a hand just to <laughs> encourage them. Well, it was about uh, seven years ago when I was transferred to ExxonMobil, Beaumont Polyethylene Plant, just a fish out of water, young Christian, trying to flesh out the call of the Lord on my life. Difficult work environment, as you know, and had no relationships with any brothers and sisters in the Lord, but I had also heard of this guy named Brian Allen from Eric Morgan and Elijah Culpepper, and I'd heard that you were leading a Bible study at work, and I remember just going to your office and asking you if I could maybe attend that Bible study. And like any good disciple maker, you thought it'd be a great idea for me to attend the Bible study you're leading. And so I, I go to your Bible study, and uh, I, think there was, I think there was four of us there, and I remember this, and I was sitting across from you. And we were in this small conference room at a lunch table, and, and you were declaring the marvelous and glorious truths of the gospel. And you were talking about the wrath of God and the grace and the love of God. And you were describing it as, uh, imagine a freight train, uh, the wrath of God traveling a thousand miles an hour in this direction. And imagine another freight train that was the grace and the mercy of God traveling a thousand miles an hour in the opposite direction. And where the collision happens of 
the mercy and the grace of God and the, the wrath of God and the justice of God is at the cross of Christ. And that's where the grace and the mercy of God kiss is at the cross of Jesus. And as you are heralding these truths in this small little room, uh, your eyes are big like you get when you're preaching something that you're very excited about and your, your eyes are welling up with tears and there's this just passion that is coming through as you're heralding the truths of, these, of this glorious God and this gospel. And uh, it was some teaching that I had never seen quite like that before. And fast forward, God had chosen to give us just a great uh, relationship, and he's given me the opportunity to see him uh, grow you as not only a man of God, but as a teacher of his word, and also as a pastor. You know, I was there uh, for those days of persevering through faith in the suffering of the loss of Josiah for those 77 days, and the Lord will use me in, in those moments with you. I was there for uh, you memorizing all of Romans, and I was there for the sermons of John Piper all the way through Romans, and I got to hear the downloads of, hey, come listen to this, what he shared, and obviously I hadn't listened to the whole sermon, so I, I wasn't quite as excited uh, as you were about what I was listening to, and I got to hear these things, and I was there when you discovered uh, this marvelous tool called, called Bible Ark, and, and how this this tool would help you to mine the depths of God's word and to see the God who had chosen to reveal himself there. And you fell more in love with the teaching uh, of God's word. And, and I've just seen God continue to grow you and shape you as a man of God and a teacher of his word and a pastor. And, and it's just been a great encouragement of my life uh, to be used by God, sometimes very persuasively to call you to obey uh, what God has done in your life. And Kendall, I have seen uh, more from afar and through Brian the work that God has done uh, in your heart as well, because apart from God working in you and affirming the call in Brian's life, there would be no Providence Baptist Church. There would be no church plant. And I just want to remind you that you have great gifts for this church, and God has called you in very specific ways in the way that you love Brian and this family uh, that he has given you, and also this church that you have grown um, to love. And I want to just remind you that church planting is hard, pastoring is hard, but God promises to be faithful to you and to love you and to be with you and to never leave you nor forsake you. And I just want to remind you that the seeds that are being planted and sown in the fruit of that ministry is not just seeds that Brian has sown, but it is seeds that you have sown with Brian in partnership with him and what he has called you to do. So rejoice in that work. And I just want to call Providence Baptist Church to love your pastor's wife. Encourage your pastor pastor's wife. Pray for your pastor's wife. She needs that encouragement and that prayer. Um, one word from scripture, and then I'll be done. So Acts chapter 20, Paul is meeting with the elders at Ephesus, you know this passage, and uh, Paul seems to have uh, had some uh, knowledge from the Spirit that it would be the last time that he's going to meet with these, this church, these people that he loved dearly, a church that he planted. Uh, he knows that imprisonments and afflictions and probably his martyrdom is waiting for him. And so he's giving these final words to uh, these elders at Ephesus, and he's talking about how he did not shrink back from declaring uh, the whole counsel of the Word of God, and he's talking about how he he admonished this church with tears and how he doesn't account his life of any value nor is precious to himself if only he might finish the race and the ministry that God had given him. And then he closes this discourse and he says, uh, in, in all these things, I want you to remember that we work hard and, and remember the week. And he, he says, I want you to remember these words of Jesus. And, and so what words would he close with for these elders at Ephesus that he would want them to remember after this incredible discourse of Acts chapter 20. And, and so he says, remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how it, it, is more, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. So in the context of laboring and pouring yourself out and giving and giving and giving, he says, remember, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And, and I think that's important for us to remember at pastors because there'll be times uh, when it feels like you are giving and giving and giving and giving and you aren't maybe receiving or you aren't maybe seeing the fruit of your labor. You know, a lot of the time that you will spend pouring over the text of God's word and crying out for the souls, the people that God has called you to shepherd, many people won't see that time and those tears and that labor. And so it may feel like at times when you don't see fruit, 
what am I doing? Like, why did God call me to this? And Paul reminds us it is more blessed to give than to receive. Don't seek to receive from the people that you've been called to shepherd. Seek to receive from the hand of the Lord and be filled as you pour out yourself to fill others. Be filled by the presence and the power of the Lord Jesus and be reminded of the unfading crown of glory that he will give to you and be reminded of the affirmation that he will give you, the only affirmation that really matters. Well done, my good and my faithful servant. And so I just want to encourage you to pour yourself out for the good of your people. And what you have been given by the Spirit, the passion and the precision to which you can see things in Scripture, you give that away so that they may see it, so that your church and those who right now do not know Jesus but will come to saving faith in Christ through the ministry of Providence Church may declare, oh, the depth and the riches, and the wisdom, and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of God, or who has been his counselor, or who might give a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let me pray for you all. Father, we praise you for your matchless grace and mercy in our lives. We thank you for the sovereign hand that we have seen providentially working. God, from creation past, Lord, where you have called us to to know your son Jesus, and we praise you for that work of drawing us to you, but then you choose to use us in ministry for the good of your saints. And so, God, I just pray for Brian and Kendall. I pray that you would protect them from Uh, the enemy, the one who wants to distract them from their calling. I pray that you would give them perseverance, that you would give them strength, that you would give them much joy in the ministry. Remind them that they plant and they water, but it is ultimately you who give the growth. And so, God, I pray that you would give Brian and Eric and the leaders of this core team and uh, just remind them that they can rest well because it's not their work. It's your work is what you are doing. You are doing the work to draw people to yourself. They're yours. You are just allowing us to be used by you. Remind Brian of that. Give him great, joyful rest in the labor that you've called him to. And God, I just pray that he would run his race with endurance, that he would not count his life of any value nor as precious to himself, but if only he might finish the course of being a gospel minister. And may all the church rejoice in doxology and cry out, oh, the depth and the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And they would see you in the text of your scripture and they would worship you and eternities would be transformed and lives would be changed all for the glory of God. We praise you. We thank you for this church. Would you bless them? It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We were waiting without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory Praise the Son.
did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you Second Corinthians 4, 13, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. May grace upon grace extend to more people. And may the church of Jesus Christ be multiplied. Be well, church.